they really do make the best natural history films of anybody, I'm afraid. I'm afraid if you're anybody else, that is, it's, uh, it's a pretty hard uh, game to match. All right, I'm Roger Kitching from Griffith Uni in Australia. It's my pleasure now to uh, introduce one of my fellow Australian residents anyway, uh, Associate Professor Laurie Lach, Lach, who is going to address us about um, uh, invasion ecology uh, from the point of view of ants and ant invasions of islands. Uh, Laurie uh, is a, a doctoral graduate of Cornell and uh, spent postdocs in Mauritius and a couple in different parts of Australia before taking up a faculty position at James Cook University in tropical Queensland in, in Cairns. Uh, she uh, is well known for a whole bunch of ant-related and other publications and produced a beautiful edited volume uh, by Oxford University Press on ant ecology uh, not too long ago. Laurie, the stage is yours. Thanks, Roger, for that great introduction. Um, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's really um, a wonderful conference and uh, great to catch up with old friends and meet new friends. Um, and having traveled quite a ways here, um, it got me thinking, you know, traveling gets us out of our comfort zones, gets us out of the people we usually interact with, and we meet people along the way who maybe have a different world view and maybe have a different worldview on island invasions. And people who have a different worldview from us scientists are the people we really need to reach. So, um, you know, it used to be we'd have to ask people what they thought about island invasions, but now we can just take a shortcut and go to Google and Google island invasions. So what do you think comes up if you Google island invasions and nobody get on your phone? Um, what do you think? Rats, cats? Goats, monkeys, <laughs> humans. Okay, well, nobody's got it. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but it's actually a video game. <laughs> um, so we got a lot of work to do. It's uh, almost as disappointing as if you Google scientists, that's what you get. And I don't know about you, but my lab code's green. So I'm um, totally off. And I don't often stand around with a beaker in my hand either. It gets a little bit more interesting when we actually type in invasive species on islands, uh, and you see maybe some of, of what you'd expect, and then invasive insects on islands, and you finally see an ant. <laughs> Yay! So my talk is relevant. <laughs> um, all right, so I am going to talk today, uh, obviously, about ant invasions. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of um, ant invasions and some examples of impacts of invasive ants on islands. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of ecosystem properties in invasions and then um, end with a discussion around uh, the role of islands and how they can help us understand isolation and genetics and um, boom bust cycles and, and a lot of future questions. There's still a lot of work to do, really. Okay, so just a little background first. So alien ants on islands, um, we think there's about, well, there are about 15,000 described species of ants in the world. Um, we think there's about 25,000. So um, about 200 species of those get around the world with human help. So those are typically called tramp ant species. And um, a very small subset of those could be considered invasive species, as in those that get to um, get, get away from human habitation and can establish in more natural areas. And um, you can see there a little map of alien ant richness around the world from Dawson et al. Um, and you can see some, some areas, like Madagascar, pretty high um, alien ant richness. Unlike a lot of other invasive species, ants are typically introduced uh, accidentally. So um, unlike uh, this morning we heard from Tim, um, where uh, clearly it must be the case that you've got a lot of information about how many birds establish and when and how often they're introduced. With ant species, we really don't know a lot of that information because it's al almost always accidental. Although I have to say there are a few people who do trade in invasive ants and I yeah, don't know how, <laughs> how they're getting away with it. Um, okay, and, and they do get around because there are so many pathways by which they can get around. So this, was, this is a preliminary results of a pathway analysis 
um, done by Melody McGuck at Monash University and the Invasive Species Council in Australia. And what you can see there is that um, ants, pretty much all of the 12 different pathways that they looked at are really, really good for transporting ants. So we've got, we've got a lot of work to do if we're going to try to keep ants out of, um, out of our systems where they don't belong. And um, in a recent um, assessment that I'm, I'm part of, um, an ICAT assessment, uh, so environmental um, impact classification of alien taxa assessment, um, we're finding that ants, or at least the Hymenoptera, um, and ants being a big part of that, are coming out on top as being some of the most damaging. Um, so not, not a big surprise there either. So what, just really quickly, what are some of the big things that they do? Well, they complete, compete with and displace native ants um, and, and can therefore have um, indirect effects, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. They also displace other ground-dwelling arthropods, and they can generally simplify the community. They can have negative effects on ground-dwelling um, organisms by direct attacks, like birds, reptiles. Uh, they have tri tri tritrophic and cascading effects via their um, searching for carbohydrate resources on plants, and I'll go into that quite a bit. And generally, their, thought, their effects are thought to be driven largely by their ability to reach high abundance, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. So one of the areas I'm particularly interested in is how they can cause a cascade of, of effects um, by the way they interact with plants um, in, while they're seeking carbohydrate resources. So uh, we can break this down into um, floral nectar, extra floral nectar, and honeydew. And when they go to take those resources, there's a lot of other organisms they can interact with. So, for example, if they're stealing floral nectar, they can often um, chase away pollinators. Um, if they are going to um, consume extra floral nectar, they may be helping um, plants in chasing away herbivores. Um, and oftentimes, if they're going to consume honeydew, they are keeping away herbivore enemies. And this is true not just for invasive ants, but for ants generally. So lots of different kinds of interactions. And you can see it's a field I've had um, a lot of fun um, working in. So just a few examples I'll go into later. Um, and few tropical islands have escaped uh, invasion by ants. And I've just put up um, really probably the top five in terms of invasions of islands. So um, African big-headed ant, um, up here you can see it's also in Reunion. Um, yellow crazy ant, which I'll talk uh, a bit more in detail later. Tropical fire ant, Salinopsis geminata, I'll also talk about later. Argentine ant is not uh, really a tropical species, it's more of a Mediterranean type climate um, species. Uh, but you can see then how its distribution is, is along those um, islands that get a little bit cooler or have higher elevations where they can exist. And then the electric ant or little fire ant, which um, has been mentioned in a, a few talks already uh, about how it's getting around. Um, oh, and I should probably point out that the native range here uh, is in green and um, the known exotic range is in that reddish color. Um, I hope you're not colorblind. <laughs> Weren't my color choices, but anyway, I do think um, these are really great um, illustrations to show just how far um, widespread these are. The species that is considered um, also in the sort of top five that I haven't put up there is Salinopsis invicta, the, re the red imported fire ant. And I won't be talking about that much because uh, most of the impacts we know about that ant species are from continental areas. It hasn't really, um, for reasons that may be interesting, haven't gotten to a lot of, of islands. Okay, so, um, but islands are great meeting places Obviously, we're all here, um, but that also includes for ants. And um, islands sometimes, um, especially if they have mountains on them, have um, large environmental changes over small spatial scales. And so what this can mean is that species that might otherwise occur not very close to each other um, can occur in close proximity and give us opportunity to compare effects. So one of those places is Hawaii. And um, way back in the 1800s, um, when it was visited by Perkins, um, who uh, was one of the first entomologists to go 
Oh, that font didn't work. Okay, <laughs> who was one of the first entomologists to go um, and really describe the, the entomological fauna of Hawaii, um, found that really, even that early, um, this ant species had wiped out a lot of the native fauna in the lowland areas. Um, Hawaii has no known native species, and um, therefore it's thought that um, the naivete of the native species, like spiders, um, haven't been exposed to ants. They're especially vulnerable to, um, to, to ant invasions and their effects. Right now, it has over 40 um, species of non-native ants, um, and they have various effects. So one of those um, that I looked at was um, whether they are effective nectar thieves. So um, as you might know that many plants have defenses to keep ants out of them because ants tend not to be good pollinators. They um, often harass or could harass uh, legitimate floral visitors. So plants tend to have um, defenses against ants. But what about plants that have evolved in the absence of ants? Do they have any, any defenses to keep ants out? So one of those plants is Ohia metrosideros polymorpha, and it is um, very common in the Hawaiian Islands. And it is a major nectar source resource for um, the threatened bees, the Hylaeus species on the island. And so uh, the question I asked was, are invasive ants a threat to, um, to these floral visitors? So um, there is a place in the Hawaii National Park where um, these three species come together. There's steam vents there, so it creates um, a very unique set of conditions where all three of these species, this is Argentine ants, oh, there we go, Argentine ants, um, African big-headed ants, and yellow crazy ants all come together within a very small area. And what you can see here is that um, of the flowers and trees that I um, looked at in the places where these ants occurred, um, they visited a good number of the, the flowers, so up to 90%, for example, for yellow crazy ants. And um, when I looked at how much nectar they were taking from these flower heads, um, this here is the number of ants to deplete all of the nectar from that flower head. Um, yellow crazy ants were hands down the best. They are the largest of these, these ants. And it only took about 35 of the ants to, to totally empty out um, one of these flowers. So that's their exploitation competition ability. Um, I then did an ant exclusion experiment. Um, didn't have enough flowers at the time I did this to, to include yellow crazy ants in this, but I did um, compare Argentine ants to big-headed ants. And what you can see here is in the orange is when ants were present, how many times um, Hylaeus landed on that flower. And in the purple is when ants were excluded, how many times they landed on this. So one of the main findings here was that these yellow-faced bees that rely on this resource, they actually never landed on flowers that had um, big-headed ants in them. And it's also worth pointing out, though, that uh, over my, uh, with over 1,000 observations, I only actually ever observed the bees 51 times. So although I can show an effect here, I'm not even sure what has already been lost. Um, we can only look at the, the effects of these ants at one point in time. So it might be that um, what is there is able to persist, but other species that maybe couldn't persist at all were already outcompeted. And there's been um, work since then done by Juncker and colleagues who've actually shown that um, the ants are more likely to visit the native uh, plants and because they do lack defenses. So um, some years after that, I um, had the opportunity to go look at ant effects in um, Mauritius. And um, this was my first postdoc. And uh, all I knew about, about it before I left was that they were having some kind of, of problem with ants on, and restoration of plants. And I looked up what we knew about the list of ants that were present in Mauritius, and so I knew that there was supposedly some nat native ant fauna that was there. Uh, it was unclear whether it was still there, 
And that list included some of the world's worst invas invaders, again, so yellow crazy ant, um, African big-headed ant, and this, um, the tropical fire ant, Solenopsis geminata. Now, when I got there, though, and this is the um, Elizagret, the, uh, the islet that's just offshore, that's a nature reserve that many of you would be familiar with. Um, this is what it looks like. So this isn't any of those species. This is white-footed ant, which really wasn't on anybody's list of being a big problem. And in fact, the taxonomy hadn't been resolved at that time. Um, and this is what the island looked like. Um, massive amounts of tending of these um, scale insects going on. So, um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's the distribution of white-footed ant. Um, and this is now with the taxonomy resolved. So hasn't gotten around as much, but it is now, um, I, I saw a paper out last week that has this as one of the ones to look out for. So at this time, though, we didn't know a whole lot about this. And what I was interested in is um, what effects it was having in this system. So on this island, there was the um, invasive plant, um, Lucina leucocephala, or Lucana leucocephala, depending on where you're from, uh, that, as you probably know, can form really dense thickets. I've seen it. Um, here on the way from the airport into town. And then there's a native pantropical plant, Scavola toccata, um, which probably most of you would be familiar with as well. And um, why were the ants going to the plants? Well, Lucina has extra flow nectaries, so ants might be going and protecting the plant. Um, there was a series of honeydew producing insects, so both of the plants had black scale insects. And then there were um, Seychelles scale mealybug and aphids, all which were on the native plant. Um, and then uh, the psyllid that um, attacks the uh, attacks Lucina in Central America had followed it to Mauritius as well. So this was a um, pest to Lucina. So what was going on? What was the ants' role in this? Well, first I looked at um, this was a nine month experiment that had, we did and um, excluded ants from some branches and allowed them to others and then did um, bi-weekly observations of ant visits. And what was clear, um, very clear, was that almost all of the visitors to these plants were the white-footed ant. Um, yellow crazy ants and big-headed ants were in the system, but they were having, they didn't, they didn't get a look in, um, which was quite surprising because these are considered to be pretty dominant species. There were a few other introduced species, and then there was this poor native that also almost never turned up what was around. Um, the other species that were the tropical fire ant and then other crazy ant species. And um, so this was the one that was having an effect, but I just want to uh, point out here that it is important to understand what is actually in the system, because if you then go to manage this system and you attempt to take out the real dominant one, um, if you haven't thought this through, you could end up creating more problems for yourself. So in some really nice work done by Sheldon Plentovich um, on some offshore um, islands in Hawaii, she uh, found that um, in going to try to get rid of the African big-headed ant, which is fairly easy to get rid of, um, taking that out of the system she um, then had the unanticipated um, consequences of the crazy ants increasing and um, the tropical fire ant increasing. And those, uh, because of that, they then started to affect the bird population. So, so generally speaking, we might not worry about too much about richness because just one ant species can be bad enough to have damage. Um, but you do need to take, consider, take account of the whole ecosystem if you're going to start to try to remove one. But anyway, so what were these doing to the plants? So uh, like I said, we did exclusion experiments. And what we found was that, um, not surprisingly, the ants were interfering with the predators of the um, scale insects. And that was um, causing the scale insects to increase and having a negative effect on the plants, except that uh, on, on Lucina, um, the ants were actually attacking the psyllids and having it then um, preventing the psyllids from having a neg negative effect on the plant. And so overall, um, 
the ants were having a positive effect on the invasive species, and we, um, d we looked at seed set, for example, and, and growth, both of which increased when ants were visiting the plants, but having a negative effect on the native species um, because of the uh, tending of their um, pests there. So different, uh, different outcomes for two different plants that were growing side by side. Um, and in work that was um, sort of underscores the importance of this ant species, um, work by Hansen et al. found that a uh, white-footed ant also interferes with um, pollination of a, a rare plant on the, on the main island by the geckos. Oh, there we go. So just want to draw out some key points so far. So we can only observe effects obviously on, obviously on extant species, um, but there might have been effects previously that, that we just can't document. Um, we can't always predict which ant species will dominate, will dominate, and for that matter, richness may not matter uh, in terms of impacts, because just one can be pretty bad. Um, effects will ultimately depend on what other species are present. And plant-derived carbohydrates can be really important for mediating interactions. So now I'm going to take you to my current stomping grounds and tell you a little about, bit about what's going on there. So this is um, Northeast Australia and Kansas here. And it is um, surrounded here by the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area, which as you can see has a heap of endemic species in Australia. And it is the second most irreplaceable uh, world heritage area in the world for its biodiversity values. And it has been invaded by yellow crazy ants. So I can start the video. So this is a mass of yellow crazy ants. Um, and what has happened here, well, the video is going to start maybe. Um, so what's happened, what I think has happened here is these ants were nesting in what was a dry stream bed. And um, we got rain. And it was, and the water rose. OK, maybe it's not going to work. It worked before. <laughs> uh, anyway, the water rose, and the ants had enough time to move up and onto the banks. And if the video worked, you would then see that a big glob of them broke off and floated downstream. Now, you've probably heard, of, well, maybe you haven't, about red imported fire ants being able to raft downstream. So this was the first documentation of yellow crazy ants being able to do that. And it, frankly, it's rather horrifying when you're trying to eradicate them. It is very much like a horror movie. So that, that video um, was taken by Frank Teodo, who's a cane farmer. Frank was blinded by these ants twice in his own bed um, because they sprayed formic acid in his eyes. OK. Um, but uh, Wet Tropics Management Authority um, had to figure out what to do. And this is a time to point out that everything we know, just about everything we know about this ant species, we know from islands, um, which is quite extraordinary. And um, one of those examples is, of course, Christmas Island, which um, maybe you've heard of, you probably have heard of, but just to review. so. Um, what happened on Christmas Island is yellow crazy ants tend scale insects. Yellow crazy ants were there probably 60 years before they became a problem. Scale ants came in and their abundance increased dramatically. Um, because of that tending, a lot of honeydew was produced. Honeydew that sits on the plants um, forms sooty mold and keeps the plants from photosynthesizing, so you get forest dieback. On the other side of it, um, the ants are quite capable of killing red land crabs by spraying formic acid. They killed uh, estimated million red land crabs. Um, the crabs are keystone species in this ecosystem, so taking those, them out, um, their normal role is to keep those seedlings down, so instead of having a forest that looks like this, you get one that looks like that. And then there's um, been several other um, papers that have documented how that has led to other invasions. And then there's been direct impacts on birds and arthropods, bats and skinks. So really the textbook case of what can happen in a cascade of, uh, cascade of effects. So this was really important to the Wet Tropics Management Authority when yellow crazy ants came into Queensland because um, they could uh, use that information 
as um, justification to start an eradication program. And um, it was crucial because they couldn't wait to have documented evidence. And this is, of course, uh, very common when, uh, in risk assessments to look at what, what species uh, have, what impact species have elsewhere. Um, and my lab uh, has since looked at and been able to document a few impacts, but um, treatment is ongoing. So hopefully we will not be seeing too many more of those. Um, and just a snapshot of how successful it's been so far. These green areas are where it's been eradicated and the large purple areas are where it used to be common, but um, now those are transitioning out of treatment because it's getting pretty hard to find any yellow crazy ants in those areas. Um, the yellow areas are those that where yellow crazy ants have been found since the proper funding came through and the ability to go look for them. Um, and you can see that they're generally smaller, so we're catching them earlier. All right, so, um, however, of course, there's a limit to what kind of information we can draw and use um, from islands and um, in continental contexts. So, um, one of the things that Christmas Island is doing is using that relationship between the yellow crazy ants and scale um, to, to uh, indirectly control the ants. So they've imported this um, parasitic wasp that attacks the scale insects, and the hope is that by removing this source of food, the ant populations will decline. Now, I've had a lot of people, mostly from the media, ask me, why won't this work in cans? Um, so it's really not feasible for the wet tropics. Um, we know that there are honeydew producers there that the yellow crazy ants use, and this is a native white fly, for example, that grows on sugar cane and only becomes a problem when yellow crazy ants are tending it. Um, but it's, this is a very, much more complex system, and it's um, highly likely they're, they're getting honeydew from more than one species. And um, most of those are probably native anyway. So we can't, there's no um, specific resource that we can point to and take out of the system and um, have it affect yellow crazy ants that way. I don't know if this video will work, but uh, that's a time lapse of yellow crazy ants. And if you look closely, they're filling up their gasters. This is um, sugar water here. So what we are, how we are using that information about their preference for carbohydrates is um, trialing a sugar-based bait to see if we can um, be more effective. All right, so you, um, Tim talked this morning about um, explaining ant invasion, or not ant invasions, but invasions generally by considering traits of species as well as the properties of ecosystems. And um, we might well ask, well, is it, is it, you know, is what happens on islands relevant to what happens in continental systems? So we know that continental systems are going to have um, a greater diversity of ants. And so, and they've had a coevolutionary history with ants. So um, a couple questions that I'll address is, how does having that coevolutionary history with ants change um, impacts or potential impacts and outcomes of ant invasions? And do we see any evidence of biotic resistance to ant invasions in continental intact systems? So um, first looking at the um, impacts. So because there's been a coevolutionary history um, one of the additional effects that we might see in continental systems is displacing native ants and then failing to do what those native ants did. So one of the most common examples of that is um, seed dispersal, and we've seen failure for invasive ants to disperse seeds on at least four continents now. And another example is, um, that's less documented, but is uh, failure to protect plants in the same way that um, native ants do. Um, we also see direct attacks on larger fauna, and um, if I'm going to draw parallels to plant invasions, um, this might be um, because of novel weaponry. So, um, for, for example, the venom that fire ants have and little fire ants have. And then um, we can also see, and we also have seen, displacement of floral visitors and pollinators on, uh, in complex systems, such as in um, South Africa where Argentine ants um, displace um, 
about 50% of the floral arthropods that visit these large Proteaceae flowers. So um, all up, uh, some of the impacts may be more subtle, um, but no less important. All right, and then um, looking at, is there evidence of biotic resistance? So that has been looked at, not experimentally, um, for yellow crazy ants, and, and no evidence was found. I think the fact that we see, um, you know, Argentine ant super colonies spent, uh, spanning, spanning um, several countries in Europe um, and spanning uh, several hundred kilometers in a few other continents um, is evidence that there's probably not a whole lot of biotic resistance there. Um, but experimental tests are rare for obvious reasons because it's pretty hard to introduce something ethically into an area. However, um, my PhD student, I'll show you in the next slide, um, has had the opportunity to do this with tropical fire ant, um, which just to remind you does invade both islands and uh, continental systems. So um, what she did was uh, an experiment in which she buried queens of uh, tropical fire ants. So this species has a nuptial flight, so um, queens mate in the air and then they come down and then they need to go find a nest and, and found that nest. And um, she put some out in disturbed and undisturbed environments, and she manipulated um, what would have access to those queens by using two different cages, so she cage sizes. So she put some of the queens in small mesh size, so nothing, no other ants could get into those mesh, uh, into those cages, and she put other queens into cages with big mesh um, where other ant species could enter and leave. And she did this with a lot of queens, and she's got the, <laughs> the, the, the um, rash to show for all the stings she got. Anyway, and um, so I'm going to show you in the next slide how we compared this. So um, black are the dead queens, and we've got the big mesh on the left and the small mesh on the right, and if we're seeing evidence of biotic resistance, um, we're going to see more queen death in the cages that had the large mesh and less um, queen death in the cages with the small mesh. Um, and that difference will be, we could attribute to biotic resistance. And I'm, what I'm not showing you is that she also looked at what are the ants in those communities, and she also took abiotic measurements there. So what did she find? And that's just a reminder what we're looking for. Um, and like I said, she did this in undisturbed areas and disturbed areas. She collected the queens after different points of time. So she went out after seven days and collected 14 days and then 25 days. And what you see oops, is that um, there's only two cases out of those, um, both in undisturbed sites, where we even get that pattern. And most queens overall died. So there's very little, very little that survive and all up very limited evidence of biotic resistance. And for the ones that, sh that did survive, she went, well, they were in cages, so I can tell you that no new invasions were founded as a result of this work. All right, so um, just to summarize that, so continental systems do have a diverse ant fauna. Um, Coevolution with native ants um, increases the number of potential mechanisms for impacts, and um, invasive ants do not appear to be limited to disturbed areas um, by biotic resistance. All right, so the last area that I'm going to um, discuss um, for how island invasions can help us understand invasions is um, looking at the isolation of island populations and what that means for genetic diversity. So um, ants, are, as you know, cannot move around without our help. And so that means we have a lot of isolated populations when they go um, manage to invade different islands. And um, those have likely been very small founding populations. And so this gives us an opportunity to understand propagule pressure and genetic bottlenecks. So again, this is my PhD student, Pauline. So she did an analysis of um, tropical fire ant genetics um, using double digest uh, rad sequencing and um, got 3,000, just over 3,800 um, Single, nu single nucle nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, she had four samples from Mexico where 
tropical fire ant is native, and then she had um, samples from 12 locations in their introduced range. And what she found, okay, this is a principal component um, figure. Uh, the distances here are equivalent to the genetic distances. And what you're seeing shaded in green there are all of the population, all the samples from the native range. And the samples from all across these, the invaded range are all so similar genetically that they all group here. So this is the um, genetic diversity in the native range, and this is the invasive range. And what you can see is a single colony in Mexico had more genetic diversity in it than all of the populations in the invasive range which is pretty extraordinary. Um, and then she did admixture analysis of this, and it came out with 12 groups. And the way to look at this is if the colors are distinct for a given place, then there has been no gene flow in. So for example, Christmas Island is all green here, so there hasn't been gene flow from other groups. Whereas Hawaii, India, Guam are a whole rainbow of colors here, so that indicates a lot of genetic mixing or of populations um, with, uh, with different um, genotypes. And so this raises a lot of interesting questions that would be interesting to pursue. So for example, does gene flow correlate with propagule pressure? So in other words, is the arrival of new propagules rare in places where we see little evidence of gene mixing? So places like Christmas Island um, and Cambodia and is arrival of new propagules more common in places like Hawaii, where we, see, where we saw a lot more gene mixing? Or alternatively, are propagules less likely to survive when you have a real genetic, uh, genetically distinct conspecifics that are already established there? And these would have, depending on how this goes, this would have really important implications for how we would prevent future invasions. And then of course, uh, a bigger question is, is this a general pattern for, that we would see with other invasive species? Um, genetic diversity for ants is especially, or I should say lack thereof, is especially important for um, some ant invasions, for most ant invasions. So with native ants, what you often see is that they maintain territories. And so by maintaining territories, um, they don't become super abundant. But with, in, with invasive ants, um, what you see is that they are so similar genetically that they don't distinguish each other as being um, from a different nest, and they lack intraspecific aggression, and they can just freely intermix. So it's sort of analogous to losing natural enemies, um, which is something that is attributed or is something, uh, a hypothesis that used to, is often used to explain plant invasions. So often case, um, an ant, its own worst enemy, is a conspecific that is territorial. So this is how they, they can often become, have become very abundant. So um, question still to be answered, of course, is does lack of genetic diversity have a cost? We would expect it would. For example, perhaps it, ha it, has, um, it gives them lower immunity to diseases. How do invasive ants overcome that cost if there is one? And um, just as the, I didn't have time to go into this, but um, Pauline has um, recently, well, we have recently published a paper looking at one of those costs, um, a cost of um, inbreeding, producing um, diploid sterile males that are pretty much a genetic dead end, and how queens overcome that cost by actually cannibalizing their sons. So have a look at that paper or ask me about it later. Um, and really, there's so much we need to still study in this area, especially since for species like the yellow crazy ants, we don't even know how they reproduce. We just know that it's weird. Um, and still working on that. And I have 100 yellow crazy ant colonies in my lab. We're trying to figure this out. All right. Um, and then uh, low genetic variability may be linked to boom-bust cycles, so um, perhaps through susceptibility to disease. So there's a recent paper by Lester and Gruber um, where they found 16 published records of population collapse among six different invasive ant species. 
and 11 of these were on islands. So, I mean, these are, it's pretty rare that you see um, population collapse documented, so we don't know if this is um, sampling bias or just that it was more noticeable on islands or if it, it actually is more common on islands because perhaps they have populations on islands have a lower um, buffering capacity against against change, but it's certainly something we should be keeping an eye out for and documenting when we see it. But I do just want to point out that even though there have been um, boom, uh, there have been busts of ant populations in a few different places of the world, we really can't predict what's behind that or whether it's going to happen. So I just don't want you to walk away with the idea that, oh, they're going to collapse anyway, and so we don't need to do anything, um, because they can still do quite a bit of damage before they do collapse. And I'd also argue that um, in several cases, they can have adverse effects, even when they are at low levels. They don't have to be super abundant everywhere to have impacts. And that might be especially the case on islands. So um, to conclude, what can we learn from ant invasions? Well, um, we don't know which species are going to dominate and how they'll affect the ecosystems. Um, it's less predictable than we would like. And, um, but, but it's important to keep that in mind if you are going to try to um, remove an invasive, invasive ant from, your, um, from, a, from an area. Um, many of our best examples of the effects of ant invasions come from islands, and they can really help us understand ant invasions more generally. Um, island isolation and investigation into patterns of genetic um, diversity can provide, or hopefully will provide, insights into um, some more invasion dynamics such as propagule pressure and um, the importance of genetic diversity. And um, the, the possibility of a spontaneous collapse of a population really um, should not reduce our efforts to try to prevent these kinds of invasions and try to manage them when they do occur. So with that, I just want to acknowledge um, collaborators and funders, and thank you for listening, and I should have time for questions. Thank you, Laurie. We have a uh, quarter of an hour for questions. Uh, I think there are some microphones hanging around. Thank you for your presentation, Paul Boris from Azores. Interestingly, Excuse we me, found the same back. pattern yes, of uh, with termites invading Azores Islands, in which their, uh, the colonies in the Azores are not fighting each other, and they make a meta colony, uh, and they are happy with each other. In, in the same species in Portugal mainland, they are very aggressive, and so therefore, uh, the impact will be higher in islands. So, w did you say that was with termites? Yeah. Termites, okay. Yeah, um, that'll be interesting to follow. If, if it is helping them to increase their abundance, then I would expect it to have um, greater impacts, but I should definitely keep an eye out um, for measuring that. Um, hi, uh, I'm Nitya from the Stellenbosch University. Um, I would like to ask you uh, how frequent, uh, you touched upon this a bit, that uh, humans move ants between islands. So how frequent are uh, human-mediated translocations mm -hmm. within the invaded range and uh, between islands, and how do you account for that when you're planning a, uh, a eradication measure? Yeah, that, that's a really great question, and I wish we knew it. Um, knew the answer to it. Because movement of ants is unintentional, um, it's obviously not tracked. And therefore, I think that's why I think the whole idea of are we really getting high propagule pressure um, is a really important question. Are these, do we have a lot of, is propagule pressure really high and are these things really not very good at establishing? Um, or is it, are they pretty good at establishing? Um, I would say that since a lot of islands have a lot of invasive ant species, that they are getting moved around. Um, and it is a matter of being vigilant, as vigilant as you can be, but um, also recognizing it's pretty hard to avoid. So it's, it is going to take some, some real dedicated um, searching at ports for, 
looking for them. There, there aren't any magic solutions. I wish I could tell you there were. <laughs> Hi, it's uh, Elva from the Balearic Islands. Uh, I don't understand how is it possible that the invasive populations have uh, less genetic um, diversity, but more gene flow. Yeah, so um, they have less genetic diversity compared to the entire native range. All right, so, so some population has come out of that. Um, but then within that, within those invaded ranges, you can still, because this was done with SNPs, so um, many, many areas of the genome looked at, you can still group them and say, oh, they're very similar, but we can still see patterns of difference. Yeah. So it's, it's um, because it's a new technique and it's, you know, far more sensitive than um, microsats, that's how we can figure that out, and that's why it's, it's a really interesting technique. Oh, and that reminds me, we're looking to do the same thing for yellow crazy ants. Um, so de definitely um, searching or pleading for people to provide um, samples from various places that you come from so that we could get a really strong picture of how yellow crazy ants are being moved around. Sorry, if I, if I could ask, uh, and following on from that, how useful is it to study the community ecology of these, uh, whatever, top four invasive ants in their native range? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, and for species like um, yellow crazy ants, we'd like to do that, but that the native range has been somewhat controversial because, for example, all of the other species in the genus have an African origin. Um, and yet, if you looked at the distribution of yellow crazy ants, um, most of them are in Southeast Asia. So it's putatively a Southeast Asian native range, but that's really not well resolved. And we're not sure if that means it's a taxonomic issue that other, other species in the genus aren't there. Um, you could, for Solenopsis, um, one of the things we'd like to do is go and see if some of the um, the, the results I didn't show you about some of the ways they get around the um, costs of inbreeding, whether that would be happening in the native range as well. So, um, but with say Argentine ants, that kind of work has been done a lot. And with Solenopsis invicta, um, that they've, there's been several studies that have gone back to South America and compared their um, population dynamics and their colony structure to the invaded range and found that they're very much different. I have to, so by way of thanks, I just, if I may, uh, one of my greatest natural history recollections is bouncing along a, 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 a forest track in Christmas Island holding the critically, an, an individual of the critically endangered abbot's booby with my hand around its beak in the hope that it wouldn't attack me to take it back to have the, the, the uh, crazy ants washed off it. Um, these birds can only take off from canopy if they happen to get onto the forest floor, which this one for some reason had, they uh, simply um, get chewed up very, very slowly, starting with the eyes mm -hmm. by these yellow crazy ants. So it's really, really nice to see the bigger picture of that um, very memorable occasion. So I'd like you all to join with me thank in thanking Laurie for a, a great presentation. Thank you, Laurie. <laughs>conference guide for more information, so you are all welcome. It will be in French, so, uh, yeah, but there will be some drinks and appetizers for the people who would like to join. And for tomorrow morning, everyone, uh, 8, uh, 8 uh, a.m.
uh, the meeting point at the university. So when you arrive at the university, please collect your lunch bag for the day. Um, every, except for, for the marine trip, everyone take your rain jacket because the weather, it may be, it may be raining in the heights. And for this afternoon again, uh, don't forget to bring back your uh, beer cup for the poster session. And don't forget to vote for the poster online on Vox Vote. And I send a, around an email with the code to enter your, your best poster of the day. Thank you very much.